Well, good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Harmon Museum's Lunch and Learn for November 2019. Um, every time I introduce Fred, I always say it's our good friend, Fred Compton. And uh, Fred has spoken here more than anybody else except one person. That's me. Uh, uh, but I do think Fred's got the, the, the biggest crowd yet, so I've got a goal to reach now. Uh, Fred, uh, 10 years ago, Fred wrote the book uh, More, uh, Tales from the Inside. Fred started working at the Golden Lamb back in 1966 as a busboy uh, while in high school, and then he did it through college at Miami, getting a degree in journalism, and he expected to quit pretty soon after that, but he, he waited until 35 years later. Uh, uh, his first talk here was Tales from the Inside, and I actually think we used this title once before. I may be wrong, but I think there was more Tales from the Inside. Uh, so this is Tales from the Inside, what, 0.20 or something. Um, he did speak here, You Better Watch Out, A Religious History of Santa Claus. Uh, he spoke of an invented tradition, the true story of American Thanksgiving, uh, American English as a foreign language, how long is once in a blue moon? Uh, Inns and the Taverns of the 19th Century, an untarnished history, memorabilia for 300 years of the Golden Lamb, and it, it's about time. We finally got Fred to talk about his collection of uh, cheap Chinese watches. Uh, it's, it's about time. Uh, the history of timekeeping. Um, Fred tells me that most of the stories he's going to tell you did not make it into his book. His book, unfortunately, is out of print, and I think you could probably still get it on eBay or Amazon, but you got to get a loan first or something. Uh, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Fred Compton. Thank you all very much. Let me get my water. And I ask the same question every year when I start, can you all hear me? We've had problems in the past that uh, everybody's okay. All right. Well, as John had mentioned, I had been here several times before when he called back in, I guess it was February, and invited me to speak again. We would always talk about topics, and I had said to him at that time, you know, I just realized, and I didn't realize, 2019 marked the 10th anniversary of the publication Tales from the Inside. I had not thought much about it. And I said, it might be good. There, there are some stories that didn't make it into the book that the publisher would not let me put in for one reason or another. And, and let me tell you up front, nothing gossipy, nothing derogatory, nothing that's going to embarrass anybody. But these were just stories that they said, for one reason or another, we're not going to print that. No, no, we're not going to print that. And it's interesting. I, I was looking through some of my Golden Lamb memorabilia for, for another item, and I ran across this. And this, this is the original manuscript for the book. Started out under a, with another title, Now a Modern Hotel, The History of the Golden Lamb. And the publisher didn't like that title. They said, we've got to get the name Golden Lamb in there somewhere. That's, going to, that's what's going to attract people. So at their insistence, they, they gave me four suggestions, and Tales from the Inside I thought was the best of the four. So that's, that's what we went with. As, as John had mentioned, the book has been out of print for a couple of years now. It would have been out of print longer, but the Historical Society did do a printing about three years ago. And it, it's interesting. Uh, there were, once the book sold out, there were copies on eBay and Amazon for just ridiculous prices, $150, $160 for a new copy. And as I said here one year, for $160, bucks, i will bring my own copy to your house and read it to you. But I, I, tell, I tell this because about four or five weeks ago, I'm, I'm big on eBay when I collect gold and land memorabilia. I looked on eBay and there was a copy of Tales from the Inside at, at, a, at a reasonable price. It was like $19.95. So I quickly posted a link to that uh, item on my Facebook page. 
Within 10 minutes, I, I got a message from somebody saying, thank you very much, I bought your book. <laughs> Such is the power of social media. So we're gonna talk about things that, as I say, did not make it into the book. And one of the things that I've never talked about, primarily because nobody's ever asked me, is how I wound up the golden lamb. And it's not a particularly interesting story uh, in, in most respects, but I thought I, I would go through it. I mentioned it in the book and the publisher said, Nobody wants to hear about that. <laughs> if you were here two years ago, I guess, when we talked about time, you, you heard me tell the story about my father who was in radio. And my father worked for Crosley Broadcasting in Cincinnati when it was a real radio station and not, not what it is now. But he and my mother came out here in 19, about 1941. And he worked at the big tower in Mason, and he worked there from 1941 to 1960. And 1960 on a Saturday night, and I remember it very well, sitting around a kitchen table and he, and he told my mother, he said, Gertie, I don't feel so good. We called a doctor, Dr. Batchy in Mason, some of you might remember him, and doctors still made house calls then. He got there and said, Ozzy, I think you're having a heart attack. You have to go to the hospital. And he did, he had. That was the last time I saw him. Now when he had a heart attack in 1960, this was before the age of, of stents and valve replacements and bypasses and pacemakers. They just kind of put you in an oxygen tent and hope that you got better. And unfortunately he didn't. He died a week later. So suddenly, here's my mother, 1940s housewife, he got married, stayed home had kids, took care of the house. She now has three sons to raise, mortgage payments, car payments, utilities, got to buy food, and she hadn't worked probably in 20 years. So she very fortunately got a job with the school systems very quickly. Um, she was a lunch lady, worked in a cafeteria, an old-fashioned lunch lady, when they really cooked in cafeterias. <laughs> Not like it is today. And, and it was great, because her schedule, of course, mimicked ours. We were off on weekends, she was off on weekends. We were off on holidays, she was off on holidays. We had summer vacations, she had summer vacations. So it was perfect. But after a couple of years, she realized that it just, it wasn't enough. So she had a friend who was working at the Golden Land part-time. And she told her, said, Gertie said, they're always hiring people part-time. You could work maybe some evenings or weekends, because she was always a great baker, loved to bake. And she applied at the hotel in 64, got hired immediately and, and went to work in the bakery and worked there weekends and summers until 1981 when, when she retired from everything. After she'd been there a couple of years, she said to me one day, she said, you know, the, the hotel's always looking for busboys. You should go up and apply. What she was really saying was, get your tail off the couch, stop watching TV, <laughs> and go out and get a job. So I went up and I filled out, dutifully filled out an application. This was in the summer. Didn't think any more about it. Never heard anything. And it was in November. That following fall, I had been out to a basketball game or a movie or something. And I got home. My mom said, the hotel called. They want to see you in the morning. And I said, well, am I, am I going to go to work? Is it for an interview? She said, I, I don't know. They just called. They would launch you there at, at 9.30 tomorrow morning. So we scrambled around, found a white shirt, a pair of black pants, even had a black bow tie somewhere for some reason. And I went to the Golden Lamb the next morning, was interviewed by a guy named Lee Wiederholt. I don't, some of you may have known Lee. He was with, Mason, with Lebanon schools for years and years and years. And half an hour later, I was a busboy at the Golden Lamb. <laughs> Worked a double shift. Went to work about 10 o'clock in the morning, worked at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That's what they did then. You worked a lot of doubles. 10 o'clock in the morning to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and had about a two-hour break, came back about 4 o'clock and worked until 9. And I had to leave at 9 o'clock because I was under the age of 16 and you couldn't work past 9 o'clock. So my mother had to come and get me, pick me up, take me back to Mason where we lived. And I literally, literally fell asleep in the back seat of the car, vowing to myself, I would never go back to that place. <laughs> because the people were mean and the work was hard and I was handling dirty dishes all day and I, I, I'm just not gonna go back. 
Well, cooler heads prevail, primarily my mother, who said, you're going to go back. <laughs> and I did start work, and as John has said, worked there throughout high school and college, and graduated Miami in 73 for what I thought would be a journalism degree, and came back there for a summer job. And I started November 19, 1966. That's when, I, that's when I started my busing job. It was the Saturday before Thanksgiving. And I, I, I remember the Saturday before Thanksgiving, didn't remember the date. So I went online, got a perpetual calendar, and put in November 1966, and the Saturday before, and it was the 19th. And you know how they give you all that stuff, you know, what things that, important things that happened that day, and birthdays that happened that day. And I, I was looking at those. And November 19th, 135 years earlier, uh, President Garfield was born on that day. 103 years earlier, Lincoln had given the Gettysburg Address on November 19th, 1966. And so when I got to the birthday party, I thought, well, let me look at my own. So I looked at my own birthday, December 2nd. The only person, important person born on my birthday was Britney Spears. <laughs> she never sends a card. Never sends a card. So, things that didn't make it into the book. And since we still have about six weeks left in 2019, I'm going to do what a lot of other speakers have done this year. I'm going to tell my Neil Armstrong story, because I've got one. Now, despite what you may have read recently on, uh, online or in advertisements, and I'm, I'm not going to say where it was, but to my mind, Neil Armstrong was not a regular at the Golden Lamb, and he sure never ate gelato. We didn't serve it then. Armstrong was in town from 71 to 93. Correct? I worked at the Golden Lamb from 71 to 93. Signed twice. Now, he may have been at the Black Horse Tavern pounding down beers and jello shots every Saturday night. I didn't work on Saturday nights. I don't know. I don't think so. But I saw him twice. First time was several years after he came to town and they had an organized prayer breakfast at the hotel. And we cleared out the room. Blocked the whole place aside on, on a Sunday morning. Neil Armstrong was going to speak. It was a fundraiser for someone or something. I, I forget now what it was. The big thing I remember was everybody kept calling me saying, hey, can you get me a table right up front where Neil Armstrong was going to speak? I said, no. I said, why not? I said, well, he's not going to be in the dining room. He's going to be out in the lobby, because at that time we had kind of an antiquated system where you could hold the microphone and hear your voice all in, in every dining room. So nobody ever saw Neil Armstrong speaking. They just heard his disembodied voice. <laughs> but that's not the story I want to tell you. The story I want to tell you is about the second time that I saw him. I was working one night. I don't know, it was 7, 30, 8 o'clock in the evening. And we're not too busy. And I hear the front door open, that bell rang whenever the front door opened, and I turned to look, there's Neil Armstrong. I said, oh, Mr. Armstrong, I said, how are you? He said, I'm oh, fine, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm lost. <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is the guy that drove back and forth to the moon, <laughs> and he's lost. <laughs> where, where, where are you trying to go? <laughs> I want to go to Miller Road, north of here. I said, well, just, this is, I said, this is Broadway. It goes to, so, yeah, I know Broadway. I know Broadway. I said, well, if you go several traffic lights north, look for the high school and turn, you know, left because he was looking for a residential address. Okay. And he leaves. Thanks a lot. Go about my business. About 10 minutes later, going again. I look up. There's Neil Armstrong. <laughs> Which way did you say to go on Miller Road? <laughs> I said, you want to go left, Mr. Armstrong. That's, if you're looking for a residence, that's, that's where you want to go. But I thought I was, I was always so proud of the fact that, that I got to give directions to the guy who drove back and forth to the moon. So cool. Now, this story, and it, it's all true. When I included this story in the book, the publisher said, well, you know, this doesn't reflect very well on your local police. 
Probably should include it. I said, okay. And, and I was a first time author. I was going to, yeah, I want to get the book published. I was going to do whatever they told me to do. But this story concerns a bad check. And I was sitting in Black Horse one night. Dinner was over. Most of the customers were gone. I was just waiting for the last customers to leave. And our night auditor, a guy named Ralph, or excuse me, Rob Sloan. Rob comes back to me and he says, we may have a problem. I said, What's, what is it? And he shows me this check. Now, the check had been written by a guy who came in with three other people. There were three guys, one girl. Obviously, the guy and the girl, boyfriend, girlfriend, the other two were just friends along. They had rented two, two overnight rooms, had came down and had dinner, had a little bit too much to drink. I mean, not they weren't rowdy, but you could tell they were, they were feeling it. And before they went upstairs, the guy writes a check for the rooms and the meals. Now, nobody writes a check before they, before they check out. I mean, you may want to have breakfast the next morning, or you got phone calls or incidentals. And then, at that time, and I don't know whether Fifth Third still does it or not, they had imprinted on the check when the account was opened. Well, the account had been opened like 10 days prior, and we were like check number four. <laughs> and I thought, oh boy, okay. So I told Rob, I said, here's what you do. Put it on a deposit slip, enter it in, but put it in my desk drawer and I'll, I'll look at it. I'll start checking it the next morning. And next, I had, I had to work late. And I always worked late on Wednesday nights, came back in early on Thursday. So I was in, entered at 8 o'clock on Thursday morning. First thing I did is call Fifth Third Bank. And you can do what's called, then, I'm not, I guess you could still do it, called verifying funds. You have a check in front of you for an amount, you can call the bank and say, I have this check for $100 and it's account number, whatever it is. If I present it right now, would you honor this check? And if they say yes, they might have $101 in their account, they might have a million, but they've got $100. If they say no, the person might have $99.99, or they might have a penny, but they don't have $100. So I get a hold of bookkeeping at Fifth Third, and I give them the account number and the amount. I said, well, if I presented this today, would you honor this check? She said, no. <laughs> okay. As I was leaving the night before, I had saw the gentleman who had written the check walk out to a crappy old Chevrolet and get something out of the trunk. So I knew what their car was and I wrote the license number down. Called a buddy of mine at the Highway Patrol and I said, can you run this license number for me? I wanna know who owns the car. Now he wasn't supposed to do that, but he did. Sure enough, came back to the guy that wrote the check. I said, okay. And I hung the phone up and I thought to myself, you know, we, we never got beat on checks very often. I mean, very, very rare. We would take checks from anybody and they were always good. But I thought to myself, okay, I got this check for $138. The guy's upstairs asleep. I'm, I'm gonna call the police. I'm gonna, we're gonna get to this one. Made a call to the police. About 10 minutes later, officer comes down, gets out of the cruiser, and he, and he, he walks, walks up to me with a look that says, you interrupted my breakfast <laughs> for a bad check. So I give him the check, and I show it to him. And he looks at it and he said, wait a minute. He said, this hasn't even gone through the bank yet. How do you know it's bad? And I told him about calling Fifth Third, verifying the funds, check was no good. Oh, okay. So, well, you know, Mr. Compton, so I, I got to tell you, I said, we don't have a lot of luck with these. They're usually small time people. I said, this, this guy could be two states away by now. I said, no, he's not. He's upstairs, <laughs> asleep. <laughs> oh. Well, gosh, you've, you've done all my work for me. Okay. He said, let me do one thing. Let me, let me radio in this guy's name. He said, you know, they're small time. He might have a warrant or something that we, that we can charge him with. I'll, I'll be right back. He goes to his car, gets on the radio, radios in this guy's name. 
All of southwestern Ohio lights up. Turns out I have the Al Capone of bad checks sleeping, <laughs> off, a, sleeping off a hangover upstairs in General Grant's room. Well, now, now he's very interested. He's calling for backup. He's putting on the Kevlar, Kevlar helmet and the vest. I'm, I'm waiting for the black helicopters to come circling over the Ohio. And all of these vehicles start arriving. There's like, there's like five cop cars there. And so they all line up outside. He said, we're going to go upstairs. And get, I said, wait a minute. Before you go up there, I said, there's some other people that are staying up there. Let me call them. Explain to them what's going on. Get them downstairs. I'll buy them breakfast. Well, he said, you're going to clear the floor. I said, yeah, we're going to clear the floor. <laughs> so I get a hold of the, of the two couples that were up there and brought them downstairs. Up the stairs they go. And I'm standing in the Henry Clay dining room on the second floor. This is all going on on the third floor. And I hear, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, London police, open the door. Hear the door open. About five minutes later, here they come down the steps. Guys handcuffed behind him. And I'm still standing in the clay room, kind of out of sight. And as they pass by the door, I hear Mr. Smith say, how did you find me? How did you know I was here? And the cop, and his best Barney Fife voice says, oh, we have ways of keeping track of people that come into our little town. <laughs> and I'm, I'm standing there thinking, you, you ass, I did all the work. You got, you got lucky with a phone call. <laughs> Out the door they go. Comes back inside, and he says, Fred, he says, this guy's got a warrant in Hamilton County. He said, we gotta serve that. And he said, the other three, said, I can't do anything about them. He's the one that wrote the check. He's the one that's got the warrants. I, I can't do anything about them. I said, I'll take care of them. So, I phone upstairs to one of the rooms and say, look, your buddy's been arrested. He's going off to jail. I want you out of here in like 10 minutes. Just go. Hang up the phone. Now, this has all transpired by about 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, 10 minutes later, Phone rings on my desk, and the cashier says, uh, the, the people from uh, 22 and 23 would, would like to see you. I go, what do they want? So I go upstairs, and they are so apologetic. I mean, they, they are so apologetic that they didn't know this was going on. Their, their buddy told them they had money. He was, he was going to just take them out for a nice time. And the, the young lady hands me a piece of paper, and she said, now, this is my parents' name and, and, their, and their phone number. So they'll, they'll make good on this check. I said, yeah, yeah. I said, just get out of here. By that time, it's 11 o'clock. Open up for lunch. Busy lunch. I remember that. I'm running around all over the place. About 3.30, I'm coming across the lobby. And lo and behold, here are the two guys from this morning, minus the girl. And the one guy says to me, um, says, you remember us from this morning? I said, yeah. <laughs> I remember you from this morning. He said, do you still have that, that name and phone number that, that Kathy gave you? <laughs> and I'm reaching through my pockets, all the notes I've got. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, what? He said, it's the funniest thing. So she took the car keys and left to get bail money about 10 o'clock this morning, and she hasn't come back yet. <laughs> and I wanted to say, you dummy, she split with the car. And left you guys hanging. They could still be sitting up there for all I know. <laughs> well, the policeman called me back and he said, Look, Fred, he said, This guy's got a warrant in Hamilton County. They get first, they get first crack at him. He's got to take him back to Hamilton County. He's probably going to serve a year, 14 months. After that, you know, he'll, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get noticed when it'll be released and uh, you can press your charges. I said, Okay. Sure enough, about a year later, he calls me. He says, well, I said, Mr. Smith is going to be getting out next week. So you want us to go get him? You want to pursue your charges? I said, you know, the guy's been in jail for a year. Uh, it wasn't that much money, 130 bucks or something. I said, yeah, 
I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, he's done enough. I'm not, I'm not gonna bother, I'm not gonna go after him. I swear to you, I heard the cop go, <laughs> dunk, that file went right, went right in the trash. Um, next story I want to tell you, and I, I was talking to John earlier about this, this involves uh, an elected public official uh, who's wife had been here a couple of months ago, and I, if, if she was here today, I wouldn't want to tell the story, but she's not, so I will. Um, <laughs> met a lot of famous people at the Golden Lamb, and in, in the Golden Lamb book, you got the presidential stories and the movie star stories. Well, this is a little more local. I've been doing this, what I'm doing right now, for 40-some years. And so whenever they wanted to have somebody talk about the Golden Lamb, old Fred always got the call. And that's, I was fine. I'm very comfortable. I'm, I'm more comfortable talking to 200 people than I am talking to two. I am. And so I got a call that then, then Secretary of State Bob Taft, who went on to become governor, was making a tour through southwestern Ohio with a bunch of journalists from Japan. And they were going to have dinner at the Golden Lamb, and they wanted someone to come to the Golden Lamb and talk to them through an interpreter. Now, I've done this twice, and doing a speech through an interpreter is not an easy thing to do, particularly if it's in Japanese, because <coughs> their language has a lot more words, a lot more syllables for simple sentences in our language. But I came down and did the speech through the interpreter, and it probably took, I don't know, 20 minutes longer than I normally would, because I have to sit and wait, and you're, do I start again? Do I, but the speech went well. But that's not the story I want to tell you. Then they decided that they were going to do you know, what now you would call a photo op. They didn't call it that then. Um, years before, in the 50s, Secretary of State's Taft, grand, his grandfather, Robert A. Taft, Mr. Republican, there's a Taft room at the Golden Lamb, and he visited that room. In the room named after William Howard Taft, of course, president. And it always, I was always curious. You know, the Taft room was right on the fourth floor, and I, I could not imagine William Howard Taft walking four floors up to get to his room. <laughs> but anyway, they did this kind of dummied up picture of Robert A. Taft with a suitcase in his hand going into the door of the Taft room, William Howard Taft. Ha ha. And I think. Secretary of State's Taft's father had done the same thing. Now, the, the, his grandfather's picture is in the Golden Lamb book, in, the, in Hazel Phillips' book. Uh, I thought I had seen a picture once of Secretary of State Taft's father doing the same thing. Well, somebody thought it would be a great idea to have Secretary of State Taft do this. Okay. So, we get our group of Japanese journalists. And we were on the second floor for the dinner, and we trudge all the way to the fourth floor. Now, if you walk up to the fourth floor right now and just stand there on the landing, if you look straight ahead, you're going to see Sarah's room, which was the room dedicated to the young Sarah Stubbs who lived there. On the left-hand side, maybe might be the Mark Twain room. They've, they've changed the names around a lot since I was there. On the other side is the Harry Beecher Stowe room. Over in the corner is William Howard Taft, Robert A. Taft. I mean, they've got these big signs on the doors. You know, you've seen them. And that's the way it was when we were there 30 years ago. Sarah's room, Taft room, these two. We get all the way to the top of the steps, and we're all standing there. And Secretary of State Taft, soon to be Governor Taft, looking all around like this, admiring everything, or marching some paintings on the wall, then turns to me and says, uh, where do you want me? I said, how about in front of that door that says Taft? Yeah, that, that'd, be a good, that'd be a good spot for you. And it was then, it was then I realized that our Japanese guests knew a lot more English than what they knew out to be, because you could see they were kind of giggling, giggling like this. So we put Governor Taft, or Secretary of State Taft, in front of the door, and uh, he, had, he, had his, he had his photo op. But I, 
and in meeting him several times later, uh, it just kind of reinforced my opinion of him when I realized that he didn't know where he was supposed to stand in front of a door <laughs> that, had his own, that had his own name on it. Um, going to tell one kind of long and one very quick story. And I'm going to tell the story. Um, I've, never, I've never told this before. I've told it once, I think. We used to do a lot of business with historic groups. Dodge American Revolution, Dodge American Colonists, and, and we had DAR, DAC, Sons of the American Revolution, Sons of the American Colonists, Revolutionary Dames, Huguenot Society. I mean, you, there was, if you were interested in history, there was a group you could worm your way into, believe me. And we did a lot of business with DAR. DAR was kind of a, kind of a, a secretive group in that they would have meetings on Saturday, and many times the husbands of the members would come up with them to have the luncheon, but they couldn't go to the meeting. They would sit downstairs in the lobby, and they would close the doors in the presence room where the meeting always was, kind of secretive. And then when the meeting was over, we get a phone call downstairs, okay, meeting's over, husbands can come up. They met about four or five times a year. Well, one Saturday, same meeting, and there was a a uh, gentleman in the lobby, and I'm not going to use his real name. And, then, and again, the, the publisher said, well, would this guy still have living relatives? I said, yeah, probably so. Well, no, I'm not going to print that. We'll call him Charlie Smith. And Charlie was in his 80s, I would say, very active 80s. Charlie was the kind of guy, if, if you knocked on his door at 3 o'clock in the morning, he would open the door probably 10 minutes later wearing like a smoking jacket and a mascot. I mean, he was just always dressed to the nines, perfect. And Jack Reynolds and I got to know him very well because he'd been to all these meetings. Talking with Charlie, well, about 12 o'clock, call comes down, meeting's over, husbands go upstairs. About 15 minutes later, we get a phone call, and Jack took it, my, my boss, Jack Reynolds, said, uh, uh, okay, 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 hangs the phone up. He says, Charlie's not, not feeling well. He says, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go up there and see what thing I can do. We're at a busy lunch. I said, great. So he goes upstairs. Five minutes later, I get a call, pick up the phone, Jack says, call an ambulance, now. Now, this was before 911, before cell phones. You had to call the fire department, put in the call, ambulance came down. Well, it took about 10 minutes for him to get there. They go rushing up the steps. I'm busy with lunch. But I get a phone call. Jack says, not only is Charlie not feeling well, Charlie is dead. I mean... Face, face down in the celery seed dressing right here in the president's room. He said, I, I, I can't handle this. You, you got to come up. So I went up the front steps. He comes down the back steps. And I go swinging around the hallway into the president's room. And there he is, Charlie, on the floor. He covered over with a, with a sheet, of course. And the room had been cleared. And the paramedic was just so apologetic. He said, Fred, said, we, we, we got here as soon as we could. But when we got here, his pupils were fixed and dilated. There was no pulse, no respiration, no sun. N nothing we could do. I said, well, I, I understand that. You know, you, you did your best. I said, look, it was in the 80s. I said, it was, kind of, it was just his time. And I looked at the paramedic, and I said, well, he says, well, what? I said, get him out of here. <laughs> oh, can't do that, Fred. Can't move the body till the coroner pronounces death. I said, but you just told me he was dead, fixed and dilated, no pulse, no respite. Yeah, Fred, but the coroner has to pronounce death. Now, this is like one o'clock on a Sunday, on a Saturday afternoon in June. And the coroner was a guy named Ralph Young. And I'm sure a lot of you remember Doc Young had his office up on Broadway. So they called Doc Young's office. No answer. He hadn't got office hours on Saturday afternoon. Hangs up the phone, the paramedic picks it up again, gets an outside line. He said, well, I, I, I got his home number, so let me, let me call him there. I said, give me the phone. He dials Doc Young's home number. There's nobody there. 
picks up the phone, clicks up the phone, picks it up, gets an outside line, and he says, look, so we, we got a deal with, with the Butler County Corner. So they have people on staff 24-7. We'll get one. I said, give me the damn phone. And he hands the phone to me. It's 1 o'clock on a, on a sunny Saturday in June. I knew Ralph Young liked to walk the golf course. Harmon over here. That was his exercise. Get an outside line. I tell the cashier, look, call over to Harmon Golf Club. Get a, get a get hold of a guy named Dick James. When you get him on the phone, call me back. About five minutes later, I got Dick James on the phone. I said, Dick, I'm looking for Ralph Young. I said, he's, I got an emergency here. He said, oh, yeah. I said, Doc Young. He said, he started walking about 20 minutes ago. He should be about number two by now. I said, well, send a golf cart out to get him. Five minutes later, I got Ralph on the phone. He said, my God, tell him to load the guy up, bring him down to my office. I'll be there in 15 minutes. Charlie goes out the door. Charlie. <laughs> now, I got like 50 DAR ladies and their husbands kind of roaming around upstairs because we had cleared the room. And I went to the, the president, who was, the lady who was president that year, and I've never forget, Dorothy McNutt Weber. And all, all the DAR ladies have three names. <laughs> they, they were onto that maiden name thing before Facebook ever thought of it. I mean, there was Dorothy McNutt Weber, Lucy Holmes Hauser, Floris Monteith Monter. I remember them all. And I got, I got to Dorothy, took her over into the Harrison room, sat down with her. Told her just how, how shocked we were that I, I was just, I said, I was just talking to Charlie an hour and a half ago, which I was. I was. He's in great health. And Dorothy recounted to me a story how they had been on a bus trip to the Smokies. And a similar thing had happened. Someone had passed away on the trip. And she said, well, you know, Fred's our age. So things like this happen. So he was in his, Charlie was 84 I said, well, Dorothy, I just want you to know, talk to Jack Reynolds, and we are not gonna, gonna charge you for any of your, uh, any of your meals or any, any of the room charge, because we know everyone's in just such shock that you, know, you don't want to continue. She looked me dead in the eye and said, nope, we're here, let's do it. They walked right back in that room, sat down, had lunch. <laughs> with a speaker, with a speaker. I had, uh, I had thought about giving them the, meal, the meals to go, but I thought, yeah. <laughs> we got about five minutes left. I'm going to finish up very quickly telling a story that I told two or three years ago. But it, it is my absolute favorite Golden Lamb story that didn't, that didn't make it in the book. And another one of these was, like, I got living relatives. Yeah, yeah, well, I can't publish that. This happened... Well, it, was after, it was after the bicentennial, I know that. It was after the bicentennial. So we'll, we'll say 1980. I'm coming back from the bank one day, and I see these little piles of sawdust all along the pillars that are holding up the balcony. And I thought, oh boy, termites. So I called our pest control guy named Ray Powell, who handled all of our controls for us. He came down and he gets up on a ladder and he pries back some boards and he's shining in with his flashlight. He's got a steel rod and he's thumping on boards. <coughs> Climbs back down off the ladder and says, well, said, you haven't got termites. But just as bad, you got carpenter ants. <laughs> and I said, well, Ray, I mean, is it, is it, is it safe? Do we, what? He said, I'm a pest guy. I'm not an, an engineer. Call somebody else. So we called a guy named George Hartz. Now, some of you, I'm sure a lot of you may remember George Hartz. George was a builder in the 50s and the 60s. Built a lot of houses up on North 42, what, what we realtors call brick box ranches. Ranch style house, three bedrooms on a slab, single car, maybe a double car garage. But by this time, George was out of the home building business and doing remodeling. And any remodeling done at the Golden Lamb, George Hartz did it. Because he was a great craftsman. So we call George, he comes down, he gets up on a ladder and he pulls the boards back. He's looking around like this. He uses a broom handle and thumps on some boards. Climbs back down, looks at Jack Reynolds and I and says, whole thing's gotta come down, be replaced. We about fainted. 
that balcony had been up since like 1935. And well, George, the whole, I mean, can't we just repair? You know, maybe you could, he looked at Jack and to this day, I remember what he said. He said, I wouldn't want my mother standing up there. Well, boy, that's all it took. George got his crew together. They came down and disassembled the balcony. Started building from the ground up. And yeah, that's, that's when we found something out, out very interesting. If you look at, at old pictures of the Golden Lamb, you will see the pillars on the front are round. If you look up there today, the pillars on the ground are square. That's because it's a different balcony. And, and we found out that round pillars cost like, <coughs> excuse me, $4,000 a piece, whereas square pillars cost like 2000 So we went with square pillars. <laughs> Took them about four months to do it. And when they got done, there's the balcony. Looks like it's been there forever, which is the key to any successful remodeling job. We went back to running our hotel. George went back to remodeling. Didn't think any more about it. Until about six months later, when I pick up a copy of the, of the Western Star, the you know, weekly newspaper that came out every Wednesday, and there on the front page of the Western Star is a picture of our builder, George Hartz, standing beside his new gazebo made from the pillars of the old golden land. <laughs> And ladies and gentlemen, that gazebo is standing on Orchard Avenue to this day. <laughs> now, in deference to George, honest guy, good guy, holding up three floors of a balcony is a lot more difficult than holding up the roof of a gazebo. <coughs> but I just thought it was so interesting that those pillars that were so bad found new life about six blocks away. <laughs> There's certainly a lot more stories to tell. Uh, stories I could tell about the weird calls that I used to get on Christmas Day when I worked. And, and I used to work on Christmas Day when I was single. Until I got married, my wife said, you're not going to do that anymore. You know? <laughs> or stories about, uh, oh, the guy that I found on the third floor balcony, local resident, on the third floor balcony at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning singing cowboy songs. Or the former Miss America who just absolutely refused to let us hang up her mink coat and, and the really crazy reason why. And who knows? Another 10 years pass, and maybe I'll tell those too. Thank you all very much. Thanks a lot, Fred. Do you have any questions for Fred? Well, two things I want to tell you, Fred. One, that prayer breakfast was sponsored by the Warren County Historical oh, Society. What? And it, it was a bison, the, the National Bicentennial Prayer Breakfast. So we did get Neil to do that. And it was in uh, either 13, 2013 or 2014 that the Golden Lamb finally got a Taft to sleep in the Taft room. Uh, <laughs> former Governor Bob Taft, your Secretary of State, and his wife, Hope, did spend the night in the Taft room. And I think, I think it was either in the early 40s when Senator Bob Taft, Mr. Republican, was here. Uh, on that day, for some reason, he went to every single fraternal organization in Lebanon and gave a speech. So he was at the Masonics he, he, Temple. He was at the, the Rotary. He was at the Kiwanis. And he was at the Grange. And it was that time that he had that picture taken in front of uh, the Taft room. Well. Thank you folks for joining us. We do have Fred's book on Lebanon, which is for sale in the gift shop. Please remember that gift shop purchases are 10% off today. And we do have the Kevin Harris uh, print uh, um, artwork, which is up for the very first time, only less than a week now. And hopefully we'll see you uh, next month for the Bones of Cincinnati. Thank you very much.